Hello, hello, and good morning, and good afternoon from wherever you are joining us from today. My name is Dr. Tashina Reeder, and I am thankful that you have decided to join us for the next 90 minutes or so as we have a discussion about access and dental care with Dr. Carrie Hexham. So before we get started, there are a few things I would like to run past you so that you, you'll have an awareness of how to uh, navigate through this webinar presentation. The chat box has been disabled. However, you can ask all of your questions and answer um, the questions in the Q&A box below. At the end of the presentation, all of your questions will be answered. Also, prior to ending the presentation, do not log off. Um, we will prompt you, excuse me, um, Zoom rather, will prompt you to complete a survey. So we want to hear your feedback on your experience of today's webinar. So don't log off. When we end it, you'll be prompted. Just pay attention to your screen. A link will pop up and you'll complete the survey. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over this presentation to Dr. Hexham. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to switch it so that. Are you guys just seeing the, the regular slideshow? I, I will assume that you are. Um, so I am Dr. Kari Hexham. I am the chief dental officer here at Philadelphia Fight. And uh, I just wanted to thank everyone in the Philadelphia Fight Education Department, everyone who has been working on AIDS Education Month. Um, this is my first webinar that I've given as part of the Community Health Training Alliance. I have done some presentations at AIDS Education Month events in the past. So um, this is a very different experience for me to be presenting virtually rather than in person, but I'm excited to be here. And the topic for today's presentation is about accessing dental care. So what I really wanted to do was give all of you who are on the call um, information about how to access dental care so that when you're, you know, trying to figure out how to get the care you need or working with patients or working with clients, you have some of the tools in your toolbox that I have when I'm thinking through these problems on behalf of, of my patients and clients and, and loved ones. So this is the abstract that I, that was on the registration information, but basically, you know, access to dental healthcare is challenging for a number of reasons, including the limited number of dentists to accept Medicaid or patients otherwise unable to pay for dental care, limited appointment availability for providers who do accept Medicaid or offer sliding scales, limited coverage for rehabilitative procedures, including root canals, crowns, and dentures, and patients with a history of dental trauma and dental fear. Developing a skill set to successfully navigate these barriers to dental care is essential if you want to increase access, either for you or for your patients and clients. This presentation has four learning objectives. One is to identify the predominant barriers in accessing dental care that you or your clients or patients are facing. Two is to describe the dental health care system, workforce, and financing landscape. And in particular, I focus on Philadelphia in that description, though some of the description is relevant more broadly. I know more broadly, I know that there are people on this webinar from outside of Philadelphia, which is very exciting. Um, three is to develop strategies to address some of these barriers to accessing dental health care. And four is to understand how advocacy can improve access to dental health care for all. So just a few brief words about Philadelphia Fight Family Dentistry. We opened in January 2016, so this is our fifth year in operation. And we opened as part of Philadelphia Fight's transition from an aid service organization to a federally qualified health center. We offer urgent care, comprehensive care, and um, there's a typo here, but integrated care. Urgent care is really focused on problem-based visits. 
Um, we have in-person appointments for urgent care as well as televisits for urgent care. Televisits are new to us in the, the COVID era. Uh, we usually focus on um, urgent fillings, urgent extractions. We also will make interim partials as part of urgent care. And comprehensive care then is, is more of what you would traditionally expect when you go to your private practice dentist. It's, it's focused on stabilization. Um, so as many visits as it takes to get someone from a state where, you know, they're actively needing to visit a dentist, haven't been in a while, to, um, to dental health, uh, focusing on, you know, addressing all the areas of decay as opposed to just like areas that are acting up in the given moment. And then prevention. So regular cleanings, fillings. This is also where you'll see um, us focus on complete and partial dentures and also where we will um, do any uh, root canal procedures or crown procedures if the situation indicates. And then integrated care is, is how our department focuses on working with FITES medical and behavioral health departments to increase access to oral health care for their clients. So we really try as a department, it's one of our departmental goals to be available to other aspects of our health center so that when someone's having an oral health problem, they, they know that they can get through to us um, and, uh, and we can work with them to, to try to address the oral health care needs of the larger community. We have nine operatories. Um, in COVID, we were down to operating three operatories. We're slowly getting back up to, to full, um, full uh, access for our community. Uh, we do have four full-time dentists, um, one full and one part-time public health dental hygiene practitioner. Um, these are uh, expanded function dental hygienists, uh, and then two expanded functions dental assistants two regular dental assistants and two receptionists. And um, we also have a practice manager. I didn't put our administrative team on the, on the list, but you can see that we're co-located um, in one building with our pediatric medical department, adult medicine. ITJ stands for the Institute for Community Justice, which is a prison reentry program here at Philadelphia Fight. And then dental is, um, is kind of right smack there in the middle. This is just a few pictures of our practice. This is Keita, one of our, our former receptionists. Um, she moved to one of the Carolinas right before COVID. And then um, this is a picture of our open bays pre-COVID. And these are some of our carts that we use for pediatric patients. And I wanted to take a minute, again, before diving into all the barriers to talk about why oral health and oral health care is important. And when I was a dental student, we would go into schools and we would do um, health education with the elementary school students. And I remember one of the games that we would play with the students was that we would show them all pictures of people's smiles. And all of the all of the little kids, everyone knew Beyonce's smile. You know, Beyonce has a beautiful smile. We all we all want Beyonce's smile and and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, everyone wants to feel confident and good and healthy about their smile. And the state of oral health care in America today is that having a confident, beautiful smile is something that we regularly um, make it difficult for our citizens and our community members to, to have. Here are just a few stories from some books that were published recently on issues and access to dental care. Um, this is a book written by journalist Mary Otto, came out in 2017, um, but I'm just gonna read this out loud. There was solemn beauty in Ada Bass Knight's dark eyes, her high cheekbones and her smooth skin, but she was careful to smile with her mouth closed. Her missing teeth bore testimony to her life's hardships. Her molars had been the first to go. She lost them to infection in her 30s when she was working as a secretary in Chicago. No one's gonna hire you with a bunch of gaps in your teeth, her elderly mother warned her. Basnight feared her mother was right. I always feel self-conscious about them in interviews. I can't smile because I've got no teeth. And this quote is from a, an older book um, that came out in 
2005, these were uh, some Harvard researchers that went out and interviewed people who were uninsured in America. But their quote, and, and this particularly speaks to, to access, is the most striking aspect about Loretta is her teeth, or to be more accurate, the absence of most of her teeth. She tells us, I've gotten toothaches so bad so that I just literally pull my own teeth. They'll break off after a while, and then you just grab a hold of them, and they will work their way out. Loretta tells us that if President Bush were to change his mind and make health care available to all Americans, the first thing she would do is go to the dentist. I've gone two weeks without being able to eat soup, with being able to eat just soup because my teeth just hurt so bad. So I could spend the entire hour and a half focusing on the importance of oral health care. I'm going to keep moving into wh why the state of, of oral health care for Americans exists the way it does. Um, but I mean, it is, it is incredibly important to people. If you ask people what their health care needs are, you know, they'll say that they, they're having teeth, ache, tooth, teeth problems. Um, and to help them address that and feel, feel good and confident about their smiles. So barriers, barriers in accessing dental care. Um, you know, there's no CE quiz for this. Um, hold on. Sorry guys, you're gonna get a preview of the whole presentation. Not sure what happened. All right, there's no CE or quiz for this presentation, but if it was, I would say, what is the main barrier to access to dental care in the US? And it's money. Like There's no other way around it. Um, we can talk about health literacy, we can talk about dental fear, um, but really it, it all comes down, the, the biggest driver in accessing dental care, it's a, it's a financial issue. Most of my slides that provide data are from the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute. I've tried to put the year that the, the presentation, that the policy brief came from, but you know these, these infographics are, are very helpful and, and nicely done. But basically, if you look at the percentage of the population who needed but did not obtain select healthcare services in the previous 12 months, and this is 2015 data, but likely still, still the case, today, if not worse due to COVID, um, you can see that dental care, you know, almost double uh, access for prescription drugs, access for eyeglasses, access for medical care. I'm not quite sure why mental health care is, is so low, um, but, but people are not getting access to the dental care they need it almost twice, that they're not getting access to the, the medical care or the prescription drugs. That they would otherwise need. Um, this is looking at the data in a slightly different way. Um, percentage of adults 21 to 64 who needed but did not obtain dental services during the past 12 months due to cost. Um, this is really comparing people that are below 100% of the federal poverty threshold versus people that are above 400%. And you can see that, you know, Almost a quarter of our population still in 2015 is having trouble obtaining dental care uh, because of cost. Um, this is slightly down since 2013. That little uh, dated hash mark is um, indicating when the Affordable Care Act passed and access to dental coverage did increase uh, primarily for children, but also for adults as well with access to Medicaid in general. And I'll talk about this more in a slightly later in the presentation, but it is interesting to me that even in the cohort of individuals that is 400% um, above the federal poverty threshold, you can still see, you know, 4% saying that they didn't get a dental procedure that they otherwise would have needed because of cost. And I think that this is in part because dental care can get very expensive very quickly. So if you need a a multiple unit bridge or you're interested in, in many implants, this can easily become procedures that cost several thousand dollars very, very quickly. And, you know, 
several thousand dollars is a lot of money, even for people that are making a lot of money. So even if you um, are not otherwise struggling uh, financially, dental care can still hit pretty hard in terms of out-of-pocket expenses. This is looking at a racial and ethnic breakdown for cost barriers to dental care. And you can see um, from 2005 to 2019, pretty much all racial and ethnic groups are reporting an increase in cost barriers to dental, to dental care. This is in the adult population. Um, and that those increases are, you know, greater for Hispanic and Black communities than they are for white and Asian communities, though the costs are increasing across the board. This is looking specifically at seniors, and seniors are in a slightly different situation than children or than adults. Usually when we think about access to healthcare and access to dental healthcare, we think, you know, what's the situation for kids? What's the situation for adults? And then what's the situation for seniors? But this is pointing out that, you know, regardless of income level, cost is still the main barrier to care. Um, for high income seniors, um, no income teeth, no original teeth does trump cost. Um, our recommendations, if someone is in complete dentures and they have no orig original teeth, is, is a visit to a dentist once a year just to check for, for denture fit, um, to do an assessment of the tissues in the mouth. But um, you know, people, if they don't have original teeth and they have dentures that they're happy with, um, will sometimes visit the dentist less than that, see less of a need to visit the dentist. In terms of providers participating in Medicaid, you can see that more physicians participate in Medicaid than dentists. You know, six, almost 70% of physicians participate in Medicaid as opposed to under 40% of dentists. As a um, dentist who takes Medicaid, this number, like 37.5, still seems high to me. And I'm, I'm concerned that just because you participate in, in one Medicaid plan doesn't mean you participate in, in all the Medicaid plans or you have a significant percentage of your patients who are in a Medicaid plan. Um, but this is these, these are the, the numbers that are out there. Um, and yet, if you look at Medicaid fee-for-service reimbursement as a percentage of private insurance reimbursement, when you can compare like, you know, what Medicaid will pay a dentist for a given procedure as opposed to what Medicaid will pay a doctor for a given procedure compared to a private insurance. You can see that actually Medicaid reimbursements for dentists are a little bit higher than for physicians. And this was surprising to me when I was reviewing this data because dentists will often complain quite vocally about uh, Medicaid reimbursements as compared to uh, private insurance reimbursements. And, and they are less, but when you compare it to medical reimbursements, they are, um, they're not less than the physician disparity or difference. This infographic shows, well, first of all, the difference between adults and children, but the percentage of adults that have private dental benefits, Medicaid or CHIP with dental benefits, and you can see that kids are much more likely to have dental benefits as part of their Medicaid than adults. Um, Medicaid without dental benefits. So Medicaid is not allowed to be without dental benefits for children. That was part of the regulations included in the Affordable Care Act. But for adults, there are still some states that have Medicaid without dental benefits. And then no dental benefits are the percentage of the population that is just um, completely uninsured. And I think that I have 22% somewhere later in my calculations. This, this number is 27.5%. I'm not quite sure why there's a difference in that percentage, but you can see, you know, still hovering between, you know, 20 and 30% of the population, especially in adults is, is uninsured. Probably it's 22% because my number includes children. Um, the number of children with no form of dental benefits coverage is decreasing since 2015. Um, you know, down from 15% in 2010, you know, 10% in 2015. I'm not sure what the number is for 2021, but hopefully it continues to, to decrease. But then one in three adults have no form of dental benefits coverage. 
In terms of dentist participation in Medicaid, here you see this, this 43% number again of dentists that participate in Medicaid. It still seems like when people want to go to the dentist, they have trouble finding a dentist that accepts Medicaid. So um, that's been our experience here in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is you know, a major metropolitan city, but in terms of dentists that accept Medicaid, still considered to be a dentist shortage area. Um, but 43% is, is the number we've got. Um, you can see that there is variation by race and ethnicity where um, minority dentists are much more likely to accept Medicaid than white and Asian dentists. Um, as a white dentist, I can say I'm really embarrassed by this uh, statistic that only 39% of white dentists take Medicaid as opposed to 63% of black dentists, um, but the numbers are what they are. Um, you also can see that dentists that are affiliated with a dental service organization are much more likely to take Medicaid than dentists that are not affiliated with a dental service organization. And in the section of this presentation on the dental workforce, I'll talk a little bit more about dental service organizations and what those are. Basically, they're, they're larger group practices where the dentist is not usually the sole owner of the practice. But it does seem like those larger group practices do provide more access to care for individuals that have Medicaid than other practice types. So why adults avoid the dentist? Um, you can see, you know, 40% of adults say that they avoid the dentist because of cost. Um, another 9% say that, I'm just looking for my, my pointer. Another 9% say that they avoid it because of, um, they can't find any dentist that accepts my insurance, which also seems like a cost issue. There is this 33% that doesn't, that say that they don't need dental care. And I, in the sections on um, health literacy as a barrier to care, we can talk about that a little bit more. But I, I do think that cost is the bigger factor. And when you're not used to going to a dentist regularly because of cost, and you get into the mindset of only going to the dentist when you have a problem, then I think you, you, it's easier to get into the mindset of like, if it doesn't hurt, I'm not going anywhere near a dentist office. And this is one of the things that is very interesting to me whenever I do outreach events and I go to community settings and, and talk with people. Um, if they're willing to talk with me, I mean, a lot of people will be like, oh no, you're the dentist, I wanna, I wanna stay far away from you. But you know, what I see when I go to community settings is I see people that are not they're not in pain, they don't have a problem. They're not like, I need to go to the dentist. Whereas once they get to our practice, then they're of the mindset that this is somewhere that they need to be for, for whatever reason that, sh that they've, their mindset has shifted. Um, dental fear is also a factor in people not going to the dentist, even if they've you know, they finally reconcile to the, themselves to the fact that they need to go to the dentist. This is from the, the musical, the problem is when I'm presenting and I don't write it down on the bottom, I forget sometimes, but um, it's like the plants. The, um, anyway, Steve Martin plays the, the dentist and he's not a great character. He's, you know, uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of this movie. But anyway, people, people are scared of the dentist and you know, that also plays into people not wanting to go to the dentist, thinking that they don't need to go to the dentist. However, it also does play into cost because if your only experience with the dentist is having a little shop of horrors, thank you, Alexis Cohen. Um, if your only experience of going to the dentist is having something painful done, then you're gonna be much more likely to have a fear of the dentist than if you have an association of going every six months, you know, as a kid and getting stickers and um, having a much more pleasant uh, memory of the dentist. Another um, barrier to care is that sometimes if people need to have um, a tooth extracted or they need to have multiple teeth extracted, if they can't afford a tooth replacement, um, either they it's a front tooth and they, they don't want to be missed, they don't want to be wearing a partial, or they, um, they find partials really uncomfortable and they can't afford an implant or a bridge. If people can't afford the replacement options and 
oftentimes replacement options are very expensive and they're something that safety net centers don't always aren't always able to offer then people will keep teeth in their mouths that are otherwise very uncomfortable for as long as they can so that they're not going around with missing teeth and this is something that i see in our practice more often than i would like um, but when you when the safety net is set up such that you can provide extractions, but you can't provide tooth replacement, you know, people want a smile that makes them feel confident and good. And so they don't want to be missing teeth, especially teeth that you can see. And so they're, they'll keep teeth that otherwise um, would need to be replaced because replacement options are cost prohibitive. So just a, a quick review of the barriers. Number one is cost. You know, in my mind, number two, three, four, and five are all cost. But then, you know, some of the other barriers that exist are a perception that dental care is not necessary, logistical issues, which we didn't really talk about, but, you know, travel time and time off work um, also still associated with cost and a perception about the urgency or need for dental care, dental phobia and dislike of the dentist. And then an, an inability to afford major rehabilitative services. So if you need a lot of dental work done and, and you can afford the basics, but you can't afford the bigger ticket items, um, that might preclude you from even getting the, the basics addressed. And what ends up happening is that people have teeth in their mouths that are putting them at, at high risk for infection and they end up in the emergency room because uh, things have, have blown up and um, you know it can, it can be life-threatening if people will hold on to these teeth that otherwise need to be need to be tr treated. So uh, those are the barriers, um, the biggest barriers. Uh, this is a next section is an overview of the dental health care system in general and and kind of provides some some context for why those barriers exist. This is a distribution of the dentist workforce by race as compared to the US population by race. In an earlier slide, I pointed out that minority dentists were much more likely to take Medicaid than non-minority dentists. And you can see that the number of minority dentists in the dental profession um, is not representative of the population at large. And so, you know, for example, if we look at 2020 data, you know, 18% of the US population is Hispanic, but only 6% of dentists. 12% of the US population is African American, but only 3.8% of dentists. So this is something that dental schools and the dental healthcare workforce is, is looking at as, you know, as a racial justice issue, as a racial equity issue, and also as an access to care issue. This is basically a review of what was on the previous slide that, but that, you know, there is this difference in the percentage of dentists that take Medicaid by race and ethnicity. And, um, you know, that the racial mix of the dentist workforce does not reflect the US population. Dental practice ownership is declining. I'm sorry that this is a little bit fuzzy, but I thought this was the nicest image and it was small on the ADA health policy website, but basically you can see that, you know, in 20, in 2005, most dental practices were, were small practices. And this is uh, still three quarters of dental practices are, are private solo practices, but this number is, is really steadily declining over time. And there's nothing to suggest that this trend is gonna change in any way, shape or form. And so, you know, 60, 70 years ago in this country, there were a lot more solo practitioners for medicine. And then over time, most of those solo practitioners joined group practices. This is what we're also seeing in dentistry. So right now, only 10% of US dentists are affiliated with dental service organizations. These are these, these larger group practices. And you can see that most dentists that are affiliated with dental service organizations are younger dentists. In the, in the 21 to 34 years old cohort, slightly more women than male dentists in the dental service organizations. And then what is most relevant to dental health care from a 
access to care perspective is that you do have dental service organizations being much more likely to, um, to take Medicaid insurance. So 63% of dentists affiliated with a DSO take Medicaid insurance as compared to 41% without. For the safety net, you know, really there are different types of places you can go if you have a dental problem. You can go to a private practice and there are some private practices that are part of the safety net. There are private practices that take Medicaid insurance. There are private practices that partner with nonprofits um, to provide services to, you know, the local, uh, you know, veterans group or the local, you know, group for people with disabilities. You know, there are a lot of philanthropically minded private practice owners. However, that doesn't that doesn't um, scale to a system level. Um, dental service organizations, because they take Medicaid and they're more likely to take Medicaid than private practices, um, are part of the safety net and dental service organizations can be both non-for-profit and for-profit. Dental schools are a huge part of the dental safety net. And so in some areas where there's a scarcity of dentists and a problem with access to dental care, you know, sometimes local politicians and state politicians, you know, the solution to that is to try to open a dental school in that area so that patients will have a place to go and that community members could potentially become dentists who would then remain in that community after they graduate. Federally qualified health centers, which is, you know, Philadelphia fight and where our dental practice is embedded is part of the safety net. And then emergency rooms and, you know, emergency rooms are part of the safety net. Emergency rooms are open when regular dental practices are not. People with tooth pain will go to the emergency room. And I'll talk about that in a few more slides. In terms of dental payers, for Medicaid, what is covered varies by state. In Pennsylvania, I would say it's like pretty good but not great coverage because Pennsylvania Medicaid will pay for um, all preventive care for adults. It'll pay for fillings. It'll pay for extractions. It'll pay for one set of partial dentures and one set of complete dentures in a lifetime. But if you lose your dentures because you were hospitalized or because you have unstable housing, um, Medicaid is going to be unlikely to pay for that second set of dentures. Um, but in New Jersey, Medicaid pays for root canals and for crowns on root canal treated tooth, teeth, but they don't pay that in Pennsylvania. But then in other states, you know, sometimes Medicaid only pays for extractions and they don't pay for anything preventive or anything routine. So that's why I would kind of put Pennsylvania in the middle. Um, for Medicaid, what is covered may vary by chronic health condition. So sometimes, you know, Medicaid doesn't want to necessarily pay for deep cleanings, but if you can document that, you know, you have heart failure or diabetes, we can send in a letter on your behalf and argue that you know, there's an association between your heart condition and periodontal disease. And so it's, it's not just good for you, but it's also good for your heart to have your periodontal disease treated. Um, it is an extra set of steps that you need to take in order to get um, dental, procedure co dental procedures covered. Um, in Medicaid, there's usually less coverage of rehabilitative services. And by rehabilitative services, that's, you know, usually when I talk about rehabilitative services, I mean crowns and bridges and dentures and implants. Um, but there's less cost sharing with the patient. So usually if something is covered by Medicaid, it's covered. And if it's not covered by Medicaid, it's not covered. It's not covered at, at 40% or 50% or, or 80%. With private dental insurance, what is covered varies by your employer benefit package. So I might have Cigna and work for Philadelphia Fight. And if someone else has Cigna and works for Jefferson, those Cigna's are not necessarily the same. They depend on the, um, the contract that the dental insurance has with the employer. So um, that can be a little bit complicated. You have to like look up every single person's coverage benefits and that there's, and there's more cost sharing. So usually with a private insurance, you get $1,000 a year or $2,000 a year to apply towards your dental work that's the maximum. So if you need three implants, you're going to be way above that. And then um, some of your preventive care may be covered completely and not may not be part of that maximum, but usually anything that's rehabilitative is, is part of that. And I think that that's where you see that 4% that of people who make 
more than 400% of the federal poverty threshold still saying that cost is a barrier to dental care. You know, if I go to the emergency department because I've broken out in hives and, you know, the cost of the evaluation and the workup is $7,000, I'm not expected to pay 50% of that in, in most health insurance plans, not talking about the catastrophic health insurance plans. Medical insurance does occasionally pay for certain dental evaluations and dental procedures. Um, it will cover third molar extractions if the molars are impacted and some other oral surgery procedures. Sometimes it'll cover stuff that's if the person is in the hospital or in a nursing home that wouldn't otherwise be covered. Um, Medicare, this is actually a typo. Medicare does not include a dental benefit as part of the standard Medicare package though in some Medicare plans, you can purchase a, du a, dent a dental benefit package as an add-on, or if you're dual eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, that, that will come with dental benefits if your state has dental benefits. And this slide is from my colleague, um, Dr. Tatiana Strauss, but you know, I, she gives this really nice example of the difference between medical and dental insurance. You know, with medical insurance, if you get into a car crash and you break your wrist, medical insurance will pay for fixing it. And then if you have a skiing accident six months later and you break the same wrist, medical insurance will pay for fixing it. It might even be more difficult to fix because now it's been broken twice in six months, but medical insurance is not gonna leave you with a broken arm. However, with dental insurance, say you were assaulted and you got punched in the face and your dentures were destroyed, dental insurance is not gonna pay for a second pair because they already paid for the dentures. And they'd say, it's not our fault, you need a new one and that you're on their own you're on your own. So it's just like a slightly different framework for how dental benefits are understood as opposed to how medical benefits are understood. And then within the Medicaid umbrella, there are managed care organizations, which are, you know, Medicaid contracts out with private companies to administer Medicaid benefits. And there's supposed to be competition between these private companies and the private companies because they all want their, you know, people to sign up for their specific company are incentivized to be of service to that to communities and, and advertise and, and take good care of the people on their plans. Um, but what this often means for providers is that there's like a myriad of plans to figure out and each have slightly different um, benefit packages within the overall Medicaid umbrella. They have slightly different, you know, chronic health conditions that they will approve or not approve. They have slightly different criteria for approving a crown. Um, and, it, it, you know, you're, you're never quite sure what's covered within an individual managed care organization. And this is becomes trickier even because there are dental subsidiaries for managed care organizations. So if a patient has Keystone first, their dental insurance is actually Scion which is the subsidiary that administers dental benefits for Keystone First. So if I have a patient that has a denial, I can't get on the phone with Keystone First. I have to get on the phone with Scion. And sometimes the phone number that I'm supposed to call is the phone number for Keystone First. And then I get routed through like three different places until I finally get to the right person from Scion who I'm supposed to be talking to, to explain to me why a particular procedure does, is not gonna be covered by insurance. And this is why some private dentists, when they are asked to take Medicaid, are like, oh no, I don't, I don't want to go near that. It can be, can be very confusing. Um, you know, I have an entire billing department that I work with. I work with someone who is in charge of credentialing, um, and, and it's still, you know, I've been doing it for years, and it's still very confusing for me. Uh, Medicaid adult dental benefits do vary by state. This is what I discussed earlier in terms of extensive dental benefits. You can see New Jersey. New York, um, you know, extensive as opposed to Pennsylvania, limited, the limited is still better than emergency. And of course, you know, Tennessee, um, emergency is still a lot better than none. In terms of out of pocket costs, you know, 74 million Americans had no dental insurance in 2016. Um, if you divide 74 by 328, that's 22.6% of Americans that have uh, no dental insurance. And then you again see this, you know, reporting cost barriers to dental care, you know, about 20% of people 
less than 100% of the federal poverty threshold or reporting a cost barrier, but still, you know, between four and 5% of people that um, are, are not close to the federal poverty threshold. In terms of dental insurance for children, um, it is getting a lot better. Uh, or not, not even just dental insurance, but dental care use once you have insurance. Um, so, you know, here you can see that in 2016, half of kids who had Medicaid or CHIP actually were able to get to the dentist as compared to 67% of kids with private dental benefits. But this is, um, you know, what my pediatrics colleague Dr. Cruz would discuss as a care gap. So why is that difference between 50.4% and 67.1%? Why, why isn't that number the same? Because at this point, we've, we've addressed the issue of cost, but we haven't necessarily addressed the issue of access to care, of you know, being able to actually get to a dentist that takes Medicaid in a timely manner, um, or some of the other factors that may be at play once cost is addressed. Again, here you see the care gap between children with private dental benefits and those who have Medicaid or CHIP. This is nicely broken down by state, you know, with the US averages in the center. And then Pennsylvania is, um, looks like the care gap might be slightly greater in Pennsylvania than the US average because it looks like private dental benefits are above 70% um, and the might, might be the same as the US average. And then he, here's information on emergency department visits for dental procedures. You know, the data suggests that every 15 seconds, someone on average visits a hospital emergency department for dental conditions in the United States and uh, $2.7 billion. So it, it does add up the amount of money that we spend as a society on dentistry that is our dental conditions that are showing up in emergency departments. 70% of emergency department visits occur outside of normal business hours. So this is, um, you know, when, when your tooth starts to hurt and everything else is closed, I think that as a dental workforce, we need to think more creatively about how to expand the hours that we are available to community members. But uh, you know, 2.1 million visits and 2.7 billion dollars, and this is these are real, real phenomenon. This is looking at emergency department visits for dental conditions by age group. Um, you can see that the emergency department visits are going down. They peaked a little bit in 2014, and this was thought to be due to the fact that people had access to Medicaid coverage that paid for emergency department visits. And it's it's interesting to me that. Since 2014, the emergency department visit totals have gone down. Um, still, the majority of visits are by adults, not so much in, in children and in the, the over 65 year old cohort. And then this is looking at emergency department visits by payer. And again, you see the effect of the Affordable Care Act in 2013 to 2014, where previously, um, individuals were self-pay, they didn't have any insurance at all, and then they, they got Medicaid coverage, and then they had medical insurance, so Medicaid became the payer for the emergency department visits, but um, instead of, uh, I mean, it wasn't necessarily self-pay, sometimes these costs were just being completely absorbed by the hospitals, but uh, this did make Medicaid m much more interested and in us as a society more interested in preventing dental related emergency department visits because now those costs, you know, Medicaid has to absorb those costs. So now they want to think more creatively about what, what can we do to prevent emergency department visits. So here's, you know, some strategies to address barriers to accessing oral health care. And there's really three categories, strategies to improve oral health literacy, strategies to improve interdisciplinary care, and then strategies to address cost. And since cost is the number one barrier, it's helpful to have strategies that are directly targeted at cost. Um, however, we, we strategies proliferate about just oral health literacy and interdisciplinary care, I think because these are thought to be just 
more easy to address than cost-based strategies. So strategies to improve oral health literacy, and, and again, where this is targeted is at that, you know, 33% of the population that thinks that they don't need dental care. And, you know, it's important to be able to say, what is dental decay? You know, what is a cavity? And why do we recommend fillings? And one of the things that I usually tell my patients is that if you wait until it hurts, it's a major problem. But when we do our intraoral evaluations and we have our bright lights and we have our magnifying glasses and we take x-rays, we can see things that are starting before they've started to hurt. And sometimes things can be addressed with a sealant. Sometimes things can be addressed by having a prescription toothpaste and they don't actually require drilling. But by the time you're starting to have sensitivity, especially sensitivity to hot or cold, or you know, a really strong sensitivity to sweetness, that suggests that this is going to be a tooth that needs um, a, a needle and a drill. So these are just different types of cavities that, that exist in this picture. Um, but I, I think you know, ask yourself, do you know what these things are? You know, do you know what a filling is? Do you know what a root canal is? Do you know what's involved in a tooth extraction? Um, do you understand how a denture is made? And I mean, you don't need like a, you know, a six month course in these things, but just having a, a general understanding of, of how these things come together, I think helps you, un, it helps you become a more literate consumer of your own oral health care. And it helps you figure out when you're working with clients and patients, how to explain procedures to um, your clients and your patients, and also like how to help them manage their expectations in terms of their interactions in a dental health care setting. Um, this is an example of a handout that we give to patients here at Philadelphia Fight. Um, the handout is called It Takes Six Visits to Make a Denture. And basically, you know, one of the things is, you know, people come in and they want dentures. And if you don't have an understanding of how a denture is made, it can, you know, you, you want a denture tomorrow, you want to, you want same day dentures, you know, there are advertisements on TV for that. And it usually takes about six visits to make a denture. And um, that includes sending things to the lab, sending things from the lab. And it, it can be a process that takes, you know, six weeks at its most rapid and can take up to three months if there are certain steps that need to be repeated. And this is the traditional way of making dentures. And there are definitely people that are innovating um, about how to make dentures. And if you have an on-site laboratory and you exclusively make dentures, you can turn around dentures much more quickly than this. But this is, this is the standard denture making timeline. This is just the second part of that uh, denture, denture handout. But I mean, expectations are important. So the more you understand about a procedure and how long it takes, you know, the more you can figure out how, how well it's gonna work for you. Um, strategies to improve interdisciplinary care. Um, the major one that uh, research is, is very uh, supportive of is co-location. That if you have a dental department on site, it just helps tremendously. If patients know exactly where they can go, if clients know exactly where they can go, it's, it's the easiest way to do it from a patient and client perspective. Um, organizationally, it's it's a huge hurdle, you know, opening up a dental department when um, no one in the organization has ever had a dental department on site, you know, we, our plumbing is different, our IT needs are different, um, our sterilization needs are different, like our workforce, you know, the ratio of assistance to providers, all of that is different for the organization to kind of, the, the medical model is transferable, but only to a point. Um, the second aspect of interdisciplinary care, I like to call, you know, ask not what medical can do for you, but what you can do for medical, you know, thinking about ways that we as dentists can participate in our patients' larger healthcare, you know, can we, can we do screenings? Um, can we administer COVID vaccines has been something that our dental department has been very excited about in recent months. Um, can we give people at home HIV test kits, you know, can we talk about smoking cessation? 
you know, how can, how can we make ourselves more interdisciplinary and not just, you know, ask primary care doctors and uh, others who are already focusing on their areas of core competency to take on dental. Um, but then, you know, shared educational programs, you know, having dental students spend time with nursing students, spend time with medical students in their training, having shared continuing education programs are also very helpful. I remember a few years ago, I went to a continuing education program at Temple that was, um, we had, there were like OBGYNs there and there were um, diabetes specialists there, endocrinologists, and, and it was just like a nice, continuing education event where there was something for, for them and there was something for us on, on oral health and um, systemic health. And then strategies to address cost. So prevention strategies are mostly focused on children, but not completely. Um, public water fluoridation, which I'm not going to talk about a ton in this presentation, but it over the history of the 20th century was probably one of the single most effective and cost-effective public health efforts. Um, it just had a tremendous impact on people's lives and their well-being. You know, it's probably why my mom had a mouthful of decay when she was a kid, and I don't have a lot of dental decay. Was community water fluoridation um, requirements for dental screenings in public schools, um, making sure that you know people do have the oral health education they, they need and the home care that they need. School sealant programs are also a huge area of prevention. And then integrating dental care into primary care settings or really into any setting that's not a dental clinic. Um, this is also from Dr. Strauss, but you know, just pointing out that water fluoridation, the return on investment in terms of preventing dental decay is between five and $32 for every $1 spent, depending on community size. Another strategy to address costs is by pointing out larger costs. So, you know, ask not what you can do for medicine, but like screenings for chronic diseases in dental offices is projected to actually reduce US healthcare costs because some people go to the dentist and they don't go to the doctor. So if, you know, Medicaid is able to say, well, the costs are the same across the board, you know, if patients are incentivized to visit the dentist and by visiting the dentist, they're getting screened for chronic health conditions and getting engaged in treatment earlier than they would otherwise be. We're actually saving money on the medical end. Um, you know, 27 million people visit a dentist and not a physician each year. Another huge cost is linked to absenteeism and employability. You know, this is a study that looked at the perception of adults um, who had Medicaid dental benefits as opposed to who did not have Medicaid dental benefits. And you know, this idea that the appearance of one's mouth and teeth affects one's ability to interview for a job, which I think is very, very compelling and very believable. Increasing the role of mid-level providers is something that is happening in the United States. It's happening slowly. Um, and one of the reasons it's happening slowly is that mid-level providers need to be licensed at the state level, and then training programs need to be developed, and people need to actually get into the workforce, and then we need to, as a workforce, reconfigure ourselves to accommodate the new types of providers. So in Pennsylvania, we have public health dental hygiene practitioners, and we have expanded functions dental assistants. Dental therapists are another type of mid-level provider, and they, they will do both drilling and filling of of teeth under the direct supervision of a dentist. And in some states, I think certainly in Alaska, maybe in other states do um, some simple extractions and other types of dental procedures. However, you know, you can see that the, the time span from when they're approved in the, in the state legislature to when they actually start practicing, you know, this is an article from March 16, 2021 um, in Maine, seven years after lawmakers allowed dental therapists in Maine, you have your first dental therapist. And that, doesn't mean that dental therapists are widespread in Maine or that it's a practice model that um, is becoming quickly adopted. But it is, it is on the horizon and, and I think it will increase access to care. Um, implementing value-based care is something that is, has, is happening more in medicine right now than in dentistry, though again, it, it is happening in dentistry. 
but basically it's a form of reimbursement that ties payments for care ties payments to care quality as opposed to um, care delivery. So it's an alternative to the fee for service model. The fee for service model is like you, you the providers get paid for what they do. So you know if you do three fillings and an extraction, you would get paid for three fillings and, and an extraction. You know, the more work you do, the more you are reimbursed as opposed to getting paid for keeping a patient healthy. And then subsidizing the safety net, um, these again are slides from Dr. Strauss, but um, you know, community health centers are have increasingly been given money from the federal government to establish dental departments and to subsidize the dental safety net. And I think it's a great thing. Um, I think it's a great thing in part probably because it's allowed Philadelphia Fight to establish a dental practice where previously uh, there was no dental practice, and so we've increased access to this particular community. But you know. Community health centers themselves are just amazing entities and they do such great work. Um, you know, community led, located within the communities that they serve, um, providing care regardless of ability to pay. So it's not even, you know, Medicaid insurance helps us because we get paid from patients that have Medicaid insurance, but providing care to individuals who don't have Medicaid insurance for whatever reason, um, providing wraparound social and, and educational services. I, I talked earlier about how the dental um, department at Philadelphia Fight is located two floors up from the Institute for Community Justice, which is the, the prison reentry um, program. And so if someone is coming to that program and they have tooth pain, you know, the, the staff um, of that program knows exactly where they can send people to try to get that pain addressed quickly. Um, and then, you know, being a medical home for people, being being a place where people feel comfortable, feel welcome, feel like they can keep coming back over time, and and really getting to bring dental as a part of that overall medical home. And then you know what community health centers are not. Um, we're not second rate care. You know, we've been heavily researched, and our outcomes are as good or better than at private clinics. And we also have incredible reporting requirements to the federal government. We're constantly looking at and assessing quality. Um, a lot of people come to community health centers. We're not just for people that can't get care elsewhere. We really strive to be there for the whole community. Um, we are not a free clinic. Um, that is a misconception about community health centers. Um, we do offer sliding fee scales based on a patient's ability to pay, which requires that we get all sorts of uh, income and documentation, documentation stuff in order to assess ability to pay. but. That is also pretty tightly regulated. Um, but that means that we're not a way to get cheap care so that you can spend your money elsewhere. You know, we, we really do try to be fiscally responsible. And because we try to be fiscally responsible and we provide high quality care, you know, not only are we, you know, not, uh, you know, health centers actually generate economic benefits for low in income communities, we save taxpayers on healthcare costs. And then, you know, we, we contribute to reporting on both quality measures as well as uh, spending and um, outcome measures. So community health centers are, are great. Um, dental clinics as part of community health centers are important and um, dentists are really happy to be involved in community health centers. Since this is AIDS Education Month and Philadelphia Fight's history is as an AIDS service organization, I wanted to very briefly um, mention advocacy, which is so important, is probably the most important for increasing access to care across the board because it, it makes a huge difference. I think the history of AIDS activism has shown us how much of a difference it can make. Um, at the federal level, one of the major advocacy efforts going on in dentistry is to add a dental benefit to Medicare. And one of the things this will do is, I mean, the, the population of seniors that have access to medical care but don't have access to dental care is, is, has been unimpacted by the Affordable Care Act and more seniors are keeping their teeth over time. So they're more likely to have problems over time. But adding a dental benefit to Medicare is gonna have a a ripple effect over the entire dental health care system. Um, it was something that Bernie Sanders was a champion of even before he ran for president. I saw him speak on adding a dental benefit to Medicare 
uh, probably back in, in 2014 or 2015. Um, also having mandatory or increased dental benefits in Medicaid, this is something that was in the Affordable Care Act for children, but not for adults. At the state level, you can advocate for what dental benefits are covered by Medicaid, you know, going to Harrisburg and saying like, we really need root canals and crowns covered. We really need to be able to make people a second set of dentures if their first set of dentures was lost when they were hospitalized. Um, and then also increasing the dental services offered in urgent care and emergency departments, like figuring out how we can reach that population of people that are going to the emergency departments after hours when dental offices are closed or expand the hours of dental offices. And then at the community and organizational level, you know, just checking in, what is your community or organization doing to help its, its constituents access oral health care? You know, these examples range from the very expensive and involved to the not very expensive and involved, but you know, everything from opening your own dental department to just making sure that you have toothbrushes and toothpaste available when people um, indicate an interest. And I wanted to invite you all to, to be our champions. Um, you know, as, as dentists, we try to be medical champions. We try to encourage our patients to uh, take control of their overall health and visit their doctors. And um, I know that there are people on this call who are doctors and social workers, and there are people that are just trying to get to the dentist themselves. But, you know, ask yourself, your friends, your patients, and or your clients about oral health. You know, how's your mouth? What are you concerned about? Know where to go um, if there's a problem. Understanding the basics of dental procedures, including time frames, is I think helpful. It just gives you more tools to work with. And in a in a multi-part version of this presentation, I could go into more depth with that. Um, I'm also happy to answer more questions about specific procedures, and then advocate to increase access to oral health care. Um, it's the only thing that really ever changes. The way things are. So that is my presentation. Um, I do have time for questions. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm also happy. Um, I don't. I didn't put my email on this, but um, my email is just kpexum at fight.org is my first initial and my last name. If anyone wants to email me after the presentation. So thank you, thank you all, thank you, um, Cheetah, and uh, I'm, I'll. I guess I'll see what questions there are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hexum. So you do have two questions look like they came up in the Q&A box. So there was a comment specific to when you were speaking towards insurance, Medicare, Medicaid. So someone commented and stated, even with Medicare, Medicaid, my co-payment went from $2 last year to $7 this year. Um, so it sounds like that's been a trend for some folks who um, yeah, I mean, I know, I know that certainly for people with private insurances, there's a complaint that co-pays and deductibles and patient portions are, are increasing over time. And I would, I would certainly not be surprised to see that happening with Medicare and Medicaid co-payments. Um, you know, healthcare costs themselves go up over time. You know, everything is infect, affected by inflation. Um, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if the jump from two to seven is also impacted by COVID in any way, but, um, but yeah, you know, and the more you have to pay out of pocket, the more disincentive there is to, to get treatment. Mm -hmm. Another question. Um, very sorry. I had to join. Yes, there will be. So this recording for everyone's listening will be recorded and archived on our YouTube page entitled Community Training, Community Health Training Alliance. So this webinar will be posted um, by Friday. For those who are wondering. Um, hi, Dr. Hexum, wonderful presentation. Can you please talk about the importance of early access to dental care parentheses by 12 months or within six months of first tooth? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, you 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 said it, Dr. Strauss. It's um, early access to dental care is important, and what we recommend is by 12 months, so by the first birthday, or within six months of the first tooth. And the the rationale behind that is because, well, there's there's really three things. I think the first is the importance of having a a home, so that if you if you have a problem or if you have questions, 
or everyone likes to have a home. You want to have somewhere where you can go. And if you establish a relationship with a dentist early on, you have that home and you can make sure that you like them and you can get the anticipatory guidance about snacking and about thumb sucking and about teeth coming in and about how to treat teething pain, all of that information that you might not necessarily get at your pediatrician's appointments, just because your pediatrician has everything else under the sun that they need to provide you with guidance on, um, your pediatric dentist or your general dentist is, is trained to have those conversations with you. Um, and then the second thing, which is part of that is dental trauma. So the biggest concern for kids of all ages um, is that uh, they might fall and hurt their tooth and you wanna have somewhere to go if that happens. You wanna have someone you can call if that happens and you wanna have some sense in your mind of what to do to, um, to prevent and treat dental trauma. So it's good to have that home in place. And then the third thing is screening for dental decay. So, you know, early childhood caries is, is where you, you start to see dental decay at a very young age in kids' mouths. And there are risk factors for it. There are dietary things that contribute to it. But you want to you wanna make sure that your child is not at risk for early childhood caries or not starting to experience early childhood caries. And that's something that we can kind of directly target and address at those early child uh, visits. Thank you for the response. Um, another question, are you, or is fight taking on new um, patients? Um, so right now, hold on, I, I just had my spreadsheet out. I think we're, we, we just opened up because we just um, went from our COVID uh, treatment rooms to, um, to being open more broadly. I'm trying to see how many new patient appointments we have a week. Uh, we have, so right now we have, we have 10 a week. Um, but I want to be clear that those, the reason why we have so few new patient appointments are because once you become a new patient, that's where you are eligible for comprehensive care. And we still have about a third of our appointments a week dedicated to urgent care. So urgent care is something that um, you're not screened by our receptionists or by any of our staff for. If you think you have a dental problem, we can get you in for an urgent care visit. And that problem could be, I think I have cavities. But what we were trying to prioritize is making space for people that have urgent problems instead of people that, you know, were otherwise regularly accessing the dentist and just needed to get in for a six month cleaning but didn't have any active concerns. But we are now trying to evolve in this kind of post COVID period to, to having new patients that don't have active concerns as well as those that do. This third one is a comment slash question. Could you mention the high overhead of dental procedures? For example, materials, PPE instruments, and why more extensive procedures like dentures are more expensive, lab costs, for example, um, for our consumers in that at fight, you're also accepting donations are always welcome. Um, I mean, dental, dental procedures have a lot of like stuff involved. Like if we're gonna be doing a dental filling and you like, you come in and you look at what, what our tray involves, you know, there's probably 20 different instruments and 15 different types of materials all on the tray. And that's not including what we have in the back if we need to do something different. And it just, it makes the overhead associated with an individual, individual dental visit, um, I would argue higher than the relative overhead for a medical visit um, because we just need so much stuff in order to do any, to do anything. It feels like most days, um, and uh, why? I'm, I'm just reading the question. Um, so, and then anything where we have to work with an outside laboratory is also going to add to the cost of what we do because sometimes outside laboratories will give safety net clinics. A little bit of a discount, but they also need to cover all of their costs. And so one of the things that we've struggled with with making dentures, because our sliding scale goes all the way down to zero, is that we still have to pay all of the lab costs for those dentures. Um, and we don't get a discount because we're not getting paid for that denture because then the, the, la the dental labs wouldn't um, be able to cover their overhead. So it all kind of builds up on each other. Um, in terms of the implants, is it, is it okay if I just take the questions as I see them? Um, so I, I can't speak to, 
to implant. So the, the, what, what the questioner, what the person asking the question is asking about is implant supported overdentures and having an implant that's supported by, by four, having an overdenture that's supported by four implants as opposed to two implants. Um, is two okay? It really depends on the quality of your jaw. Um, and since this isn't a um, in-person evaluation, I, I can't speak to whether two is going to be sufficient um, or whether four would be better. Um, implants are something that the, the overhead associated with implants as well as the the training required, like everything involved in placing implants is just not something as a safety net that we've been set up to do. So I'm, I'm not really the right person to, to answer implant related questions. Um, I do know that implant supported overdentures are recommended um, if you can get them approved or otherwise afford them. All right. Um, so I guess uh, Dr. Strauss again had some more questions about why should you keep back teeth if no one can see them and is, is flossing actually important? So you should keep your back teeth because you need them to chew and also because your face will start, the your facial proportions, like everything starts to kind of uh, collapse on itself once you start to lose the teeth that are supporting your facial structure. And so... Um, I think those are probably the biggest reasons to try to keep your back teeth. Also, everything else will start to shift in your mouth um, once you start losing your back teeth. So you may notice some spacing in the front teeth that didn't exist previously because your front teeth are kind of slowly drifting to the back, which is why that's why we recommend keeping back teeth. Um, and is flossing actually important? I think so. The evidence base has not come out uh, strongly in favor of flossing, but Someone gave a nice analogy once, which is that like, is your kitchen floor cleaner once you mop it? Um, I think that you can see when you floss the effects, the positive effects of flossing just by like the stuff that you get out of your teeth and getting stuff out of your teeth is going to make your teeth feel cleaner. Um, it also makes your gums healthier. This is something that we see as clinicians every day in people that floss regularly as opposed to patients that don't. Most of the time, their gums are healthier because they're regularly preventing food from getting stuck um, in places where ideally it would not get stuck. Um, if you bleed when you floss, usually that is an indication that you have inflammation and that you should continue to floss rather than stop flossing. Um, people can injure themselves occasionally when they're flossing, so you need to be, be gentle with yourself in flossing as, it, as in all other aspects of life. Um, don't use flossing as a way to punish yourself. Um, but a little bit of blood, especially if you haven't flossed in a few days, is, is going to be normal. And if you started flossing for the first time and you haven't been flossing in a while, you also, I mean, should expect to see blood for a couple of days. I mean, you shouldn't expect to see hemorrhaging. That's, that could suggest a bleeding disorder. But you, you might expect to see, you know, just a little bit of bleeding, especially once you floss and then taken the floss away, you might see a little bit of blood. If you're bleeding, you know, let your doctor know and put a tea bag in that area. Thank you, Dr. Hexman, for answering those questions. Yeah. Um, the presentation was very informative. It was actually some things I had a moment like, oh, I didn't realize that. So thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. If any other questions out there, please feel free to place them in the Q&A box. In the meantime, um, we are, we have, we're on, on target in terms of time. Um, do you have any last words, Dr. Hexum, that you'd like to share with the audience regarding to your presentation? Um, you know, one of, I think it's, um, I'm not sure who was, who was on this talk. So if you, I'd love to get feedback either through the evaluation or through an email just about whether this was information that, that was helpful um, and what could be more helpful information to have uh, going forward. So I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you, Dr. Hexum. And thank you everyone who's um, took time out to join us today to hear about accessing dental care. So we're going to wrap this webinar up, conclude it, and be, be uh, sure to tune in for tomorrow's webinar at the same time, same place. 
Um, do not log off. When we end the presentation, you will be prompted to complete a survey. Without further ado, Dr. Hexum, thank you again. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day and stay cool because it's a hot day out here in the city of Philadelphia. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye-bye.